Hi, good afternoon to all of you on the East Coast and if you are on the West Coast, uh, good morning. My name is Dr. Jose Leon. I am the Clinical Quality Manager at the National Center for Health and Public Housing. I want to uh, welcome and thank all of you for attending today's webinar entitled uh, Tobacco Cessation Tips and Techniques for uh, Health Centers. This webinar is being recorded and the resources, the slides and other materials will be email to you after the webinar has finished. Uh, I just want to remind you that the, uh, at the end of this webinar there will be a question and answer session. And Before I introduce the uh, speaker for today's webinar, uh, I would like to thank HERSA for allowing us to make this webinar possible through our uh, grant U30CS09734. And I would like to share some facts with all of you. Tobacco is the number one cause of preventable diseases in the United States. And the uh, tobacco industry is a marketing target uh, specifically low income populations. Uh, in general, low income populations that smoke more, spend more on tobacco products, and suffer and die more from smoking related diseases according to this study, uh, tobacco and socioeconomic status. Uh, Smoke-free policies are being adopted at uh, public housing authorities and smoke-free policies do not require tenants to quit only to smoke outside. And as of uh, 2011, more than 225 public housing authorities and housing commissions have implemented non-smoking policies in the United States. 29% of adults who are below the poverty level smoke compared to 18% of adults who are at or above the poverty level. Uh, among adults under age 65, 34% of Medicaid enrollees and 32% of uninsured individuals smoke compared to 16% with private insurance coverage. Uh, now I would like to introduce uh, our speakers for today's webinar. Uh, the uh, first speaker is Kristen uh, Tresakian. She is the Senior Manager of Training and Technical Assistant at Legacy. This is a, a national nonprofit dedicated to building a world where young people reject tobacco and anyone can quit. In uh, her capacity, Kristen manages prevention and cessation programs development initiatives with particular expertise on other tobacco products pregnant and postpartum tobacco users and community health centers. Prior to joining Legacy, Kristen was the Assistant Director of State and Local Outreach at the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy and a Senior Policy Analyst for Tobacco Control at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Um, our second speaker is Kathleen Malcolm. She is a health educator for Family Health Center of Georgia since July 2013. She's been a health educator for over five years, working with children and adults with various settings. Kathleen obtained a master's degree in health psychology at Walden University and is currently pursuing her doctorate degree in health psychology. She's married with three children and currently resides in Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, Zara Marcellian is our uh, third uh, speaker. Zara is the CEO and co-founder of La Maestra Community Health Centers, a uh, federal qualified health center providing healthcare, enabling and social services to help the underserved immigrant, refugee, and other low-income residents in inner city San Diego to become healthy and self-sufficient. Since 1990, La Maestra has expanded to serve over 45,000 45, patients per year in several diverse underserved areas of San Diego. Zara holds a master's degree in organizational management and has been actively involved in healthcare, edu healthcare education, community organizations, and other nonprofits for over 25 years. I would like to uh, turn the presentation over to uh, Kristen. Uh, good afternoon, Kristen. Well, thank you, Jose, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to Rachel Logan for inviting me to speak on this webinar. Community health centers, especially those linked to public housing, have the perfect opportunity to intervene. 
with smokers to help them quit. And over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to give you some food for thought to help you do that. I have a lot of slides to cover, so I apologize in advance if I seem to be talking really fast. But as Jose mentioned, I'm sitting here in my office in Washington, D.C. at Legacy. We're a national public health nonprofit organization created out of the Master Settlement Agreement in 1998 between the tobacco companies and state attorneys general. We're probably most well known for the for Truth, which is a public education campaign for teens. And I'm excited to announce that this summer we'll be back on TV with new ads and a whole new campaign. Our adult cessation adult tobacco cessation campaign is X, referring to become an X smoker. The start of the new year has been truly an exciting time for tobacco control advocates. And you may be aware of some of this news, but I just wanted to paint a picture for you. January marked the release of the 50th anniversary of the first Surgeon General's report on smoking. And I'll talk more about those findings in just a minute. Secondly, we have the federal government that launched two national public education campaigns this past month. The FDA's Real Cost media campaign is geared towards teens. And those ads are really hard hitting. They address the immediate health effects of smoking. And then the CDC is in its third iteration of tips from a former smoker media campaign. And as the title suggests, you have real people, not actors, talking about their smoking related illness. The ads encourage smokers to quit and to call the free national quit line, which is 1-800-QUIT-NOW. And then the cherry on top of all of that is that CVS Pharmacy announced it will stop selling cigarettes and all tobacco products in their stores starting in October of 2014. And they are the second largest drugstore chain in the country. In the words of their CEO, he said, cigarettes and tobacco products have no place in a setting where healthcare is delivered. This is the right thing to do. And just to give a shout out to Target, they stopped selling tobacco in 1996. And we hope um, you know, this is just more of what's to come with other pharmacy chain stores. And again, the hope is that this denormalizes tobacco use. So moving on to data, if you are a glass is half full person, the good news is that smoking among adults has fallen dramatically from 43% in 1965 when the first Surgeon General's report on smoking was released to 18% today. If your glass is half empty person, you'll be upset that 42 million adults in this country still continue to smoke. Several national groups, including Legacy, are calling for a 10 in 10 goal. That is to reduce the adult smoking rate to less than 10% in 10 years, which is a pretty bold goal. And as Jose mentioned, this progress in lowering smoking rates has been uneven. As you can see from the slide, there are still alarmingly high rates of tobacco use among low SES populations. And that's just one reason why it's so important to integrate tobacco cessation at community health centers. Other populations we need to pay particular attention to are those with mental illness, LGBT populations, and Native Americans. These are populations with high tobacco use rates. So again, some good news, some bad news. Teen rates, smoking rates, are also at an all-time low at about 10% for high school students. But we still have 3.5 million teens who continue to smoke. And it's not just cigarettes. The tobacco industry continues to create slip, slip products to keep people addicted to nicotine. I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about e-cigarettes and getting a lot of questions about these pr products. They're becoming front and center. Teen use of these products in just one year doubled. And in most states, it's legal for a minor to purchase these products. What I am most concerned about are cigars. And I'm not talking about your traditional large, you know, stogie type cigars, but rather small cigars that look just like cigarettes and also cigarillos, which are medium-sized cigars. They are currently not regulated by FDA. And because of that, they come in every flavor imaginable. We're talking cherry, chocolate, blueberry, apple martini. And who are those being you know, uh, 
sold to? Who are those being marketed to? Um, I know if I'm going to smoke, I'm probably not going to buy a watermelon cigar that's wrapped in sparkly paper. Um, in most communities, they are being sold individually. And it's these flavors, these cheap prices, that make it much more palatable to teens. So the headline from the latest Surgeon General's report is that the disease risks from smoking are even greater than we previously thought. They're even worse than we previously thought. The report newly establishes smoking as a direct cause of several health conditions and diseases, which is listed on this slide. But let me point out that liver and colorectal cancer have been added to the list, as well as type 2 diabetes. So Legacy and Partnership for Prevention created a tobacco cessation implementation guide for community health centers. The focus is systems change. We also have four case studies from various states and individual health centers. It's available for free download on both of our websites. I've included the links here. And I really encourage you to take a look at this. Um, you know, rather than taking notes on this presentation, you can um, take a look at this guide, which goes into much more depth than I will cover. So making the case for tobacco cessation in health centers. Uh, the good news, again, is that in any given year, 70% of smokers want to quit smoking. More than half will try, but less than 10% succeed because they're trying to go cold turkey and they're not using methods that have evidence behind them. And that's where healthcare and human services come in to help increase those numbers. We are thrilled that as of 2011, HRSA requires health centers to report two measurements on tobacco identification and cessation treatment through the Universal Data System, or the UDS. And according to 2012 data, close to 86% of health centers are asking their patients about tobacco use. And that's fantastic news. So the scenario is a patient goes into a health center. She is asked if she uses tobacco. And then what happens? Well, it turns out that a little more than half of health centers are providing an intervention to help smokers quit that's loosely defined as cessation counseling or medication. So health centers are on the right track. This is wonderful, but there is room for improvement. And that's where the 5A model comes in. This is an evidence-based intervention to treat tobacco dependence. It's written about in detail in the clinical guidelines by the US Public Health Service in 2008. You have the full link to the publication on this slide. The 5As was designed to be a very brief 3 to 10 minute intervention that can be carried out by a team of clinicians. And it can be also included in the electronic medical record. And so by building in automatic prompts and scripts, drop down menus, check boxes for the 5As into your electronic medical record, it's going to make delivering this intervention seamless, consistent, and staff will have very little data entry to, re to do, um, which I know nobody is a big fan of. So I'm going to review each of the five A's. The first step in the intervention is to ask every patient at every visit if they use tobacco and to document this in his or her status clearly in the clinical record. Ideally, this question would be included in vital signs and medical history and displayed prominently in the EMR. It's also a good idea to ask about exposure to secondhand smoke, and that's most likely going to be in the home, is there any smoking in the home, um, or of course the workplace. But this can have implications for various health conditions. So the 5A questions on this slide and the next few slides were developed by the Medical Society of the state of New York, and they developed this in particular for a community health center. This is how they ask about tobacco use in their EMR. This is just one example of what you could do within your own health center. The second A is to advise. In a clear, strong, personalized manner, we urge every tobacco user to quit. And it can be helpful to build in an automatic script for providers, medical assistants, and nurses. So you click. You know, your patient uses tobacco, and then it pops up on the screen. As your clinician, I need you to know that quitting smoking is the most important thing that you can do to protect your health now and in the future. 
and the clinic and staff and I will help you. The third A is to assess whether the patient is willing to quit at this time. And depending on the answer, you can tailor your intervention from there on. If your patient is unwilling to quit, you can use motivational interviewing strategies. And this is really an opportunity um, to, you know, to continually bring up tobacco use with your patient. You can revisit this at future visits. And as a quality improvement measure, the Iowa Primary Care Association developed a screening tool to enroll only those patients most ready to quit in their intensive cessation program. And the data suggests that this approach has yielded folks spending more time in their cessation programs and having higher quit rates. And then for those who are, her, who are willing to quit, the healthcare staff, again, whether that's the physician, the nurse, the case manager, you can bring the patient through some very brief counseling on the spot, deliver that intervention right there, and bring them through a quit plan. This will just take a minute or two. You can help them set a quit date. You can ask them if they've tried quitting before. What worked? What didn't work? What are they most worried about? And you help that person come up with a solution. This is also an opportunity to suggest medication. We know that successful interventions combine counseling with medication. There are seven FDA-approved medications to help smokers quit, doubling their chance for success. Some are over-the-counter, some are prescription, and these will help reduce those physical withdrawal symptoms and the nicotine cravings. Combination therapy has proven to be most effective. And then we hope that you can take advantage of referring patients to other evidence-based cessation services, either nationally or within your own community. Most of these will be free. Now, this, doesn't mean, this isn't meant to replace what you're doing at your health center, but rather to augment what you're doing, and it's somewhere smokers can go to get some extra help. All 50 states have free telephone quit lines that can be accessed through the national number 1-800-QUIT-NOW. It's really easy to remember. Each quit line has trained cessation coaches that provide counseling. And beyond the basics that all states provide, the services are going to differ among the states. And you can go to your state tobacco control program's website to get more information. But just as an example, you know, some are going to offer a free two-week supply of nicotine replacement therapy for quitline callers. Other states have a web-based component. Or they may even have a special protocol in place for pregnant smokers offering some extra telephone sessions for free. Many states offer a fax or electronic referral system where the quitline will call your patient directly. And for those folks who are uncomfortable with phone counseling, there are several web-based resources as well. HHS has smokefree.gov. They even have a texting campaign. And Legacy, where I work, we have X, which again is becomeanx.org. This is a free online quit smoking program that we developed in collaboration with the Mayo Clinic and with input from current and former smokers. And last but not least, again, I suggest that you contact your state or local tobacco control program to see if they have any intensive cessation services. If this could be at your local hospital. It could be at an area health education center. And these are likely going to be class cessation classes that are held over time You know, for a four-week, eight-week program. And last but not least, the last day is to, follow, is to arrange. It's arranging for follow-up and addressing tobacco use at every clinical visit. And again, we know that tobacco use isn't a bad habit. That's the way we used to talk about it. It's a chronic condition. We're talking about tobacco dependence. On average, it takes 8 to 11 quit attempts before a smoker is successful. So this is behavior that has to be addressed over several clinical visits. There are some health centers that are creating tracking systems or cessation registries. CMAR Health Center in Seattle, Vancouver have done this. And they're tracking information for patients who have received individual or group cessation counseling at their health center. It's a way for them to provide follow-up phone counseling for patients for patients, and this whole system is managed by a community health corps member. And for the sake of time, I didn't include a slide on meaningful use of EMRs or patient-centered medical homes, but tobacco cessation interventions is a way to meet both of these. And 
very quickly, this is a screenshot of tobacco use questions in an EMR from Codman Square Health Center in Dorchester, Massachusetts. It's printed in our guide, and I'm going to skip over this for time's sake. Um, but if, if you're, you know, whether you're building your tobacco cessation services from the start or you just want to improve what you already are offering, one of the most important first tasks can be to identify a champion. And I think that goes without saying for whatever we do in our public housing or health centers. But you really need someone who can carry that tobacco cessation torch, building support for the services with executive management, and motivating all healthcare workers to use the 5A model. And second, we need to take a team approach to tobacco cessation. The 5A model isn't just the physician's responsibility, but the whole healthcare team can play a role, whether that's the nurse, the medical assistant, case managers. We've included a sample clinical workflow from Codman Square Health Center in the guide, so you should take a look at that. And third, I'll just mention that we need to train all health center staff in the 5As, in the brief tobacco intervention, and clinical workflow. I mean, the good news is that there are a number of universities and national organizations across the country that offer tobacco cessation trainings, and we have a list of this in our guide. I know that one of the challenges can be high staff turnover, so some health centers have addressed this by presenting at monthly provider meetings, including tobacco cessation in new staff trainings. So the big question you probably have is, is any of this counseling or tobacco cessation medication covered by insurance? And the answer is that it's complicated. I want to be very clear that I'm not an expert on this topic. I've included a link to the American Lung Association's website at the bottom of the slide. They have really great materials on this. But as the federal government and the states roll out the Affordable Care Act, it's clear that there's huge potential to provide millions more smokers with the help they need to quit, given the emphasis on prevention. You may be familiar with the essential benefits. There are 10 categories, and this includes preventive and wellness services and chronic care management. HHS has deemed a comprehensive tobacco cessation benefit is a part of this. But the issue is that they haven't clearly defined what that means. You know, does that mean that all seven FDA-approved medications are covered? Does this mean that cessation counseling is covered? How many minutes is it covered for? So the ACA requires that new Medicaid enrollees and state exchanges cover the essential benefits so that they cover also this comprehensive tobacco cessation benefit. So without that definition, this benefit may look different in each state. To address this, just last week, Legacy joined 30 national partner organizations in writing to HHS requesting that they clearly define the benefit. And I'm not going to go over all the different insurance programs, but I will point out that for Medicaid, as of January 1st of this year, the way it's worded is that they cannot exclude any tobacco cessation medication. So it's worded a bit strange, but public health takes that to mean that tobacco cessation medication is covered. And again, I'll, um, you know, you have the information here for Medicaid and employer-sponsored insurance. I'm going to skip that for sake of time. Um, and there's more information in the guide and, again, the American Lung Association about that. So I will stop there. I think I've taken up too much time. But again, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to present. And I'll turn it over back to Jose. Thank you very much for this uh, great uh, presentation. Um, now we are going to turn it over to uh, Zara. Uh, good morning, Zara. Uh, good morning, Jose. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share some of La Maestra's experiences with uh, smoking cessation. Um, we first will have uh, one of our staff, our MAs, um, give a brief inter uh, overview of the, you know, the basic uh, screening and prevention uh, procedure <clears throat> with all of the patients. And then I would like to provide some specific, innovative, culturally 
uh, tailored programs that have really worked with our community because we have diverse cultures. And uh, so I'd like to share some of those with you. But first, um, I'll have uh, our MA, Michelle, introduce herself. Good morning. My name is Michelle. I'm a medical assistant here at La Maestra Clinic. And as part of this, um, this environment of the health, um, what we do every time a patient comes into the clinic, we do all the vital signs first. After that, um, the vital signs, it will come out if um, the smoking sensation that it's off is something that we have to ask for every patient. And it's important to us to know so that if any other, like any patient wants to quit, we can give him the appropriate um, resources to help him out too. We usually every time they come in, we ask them if they smoke. Um, if they do, we have to put it in our system to just record it that they are. If they, we also ask if they are planning to quit or have they ever tried to quit before. If they say yes, we do um, provide with more information if they re want it. Like we re we have the one eight hundred no but. We also have the um, California Smokers Helpline that we give to the patient. Um, we also put a note on the chart for the doctor to know that the patient wants to quit, and he will also explain them more in the room with, when they're with the doctor to let them know what other programs can be available for them to help them out to quit. Also, we also put in there, um, we also give him like, um, we also could set a, a goal for the patient if they want, and that goal we put them um, as when they want to quit or how much they want to reduce on the smoking until they finally quit. We also use um, different types of um, education material that we print out for them to help them out at home if they are trying to quit. Or we we also offer them counseling classes that will help them also to quit. <clears throat> Thank you, Michelle. Um, that just gives a brief overview of um, of what happens in the rooms. Uh, what we do at La Maestra for the community is be, uh, we work with our different cultural liaisons and we prepare tailored programs for the different cultures. For example, one that's worked very good in uh, the, with the Latino population is um, the children's theater that we had and it was fantastic. We would um, roll out, we would train the kids and some of their parents and that wanted to participate, and we would have them go and perform very quickly. But you know, it was it, it was really fun. Everybody loved it. We would go and have them perform for 15 minutes at uh, quinceañeras, baptisms, uh, you know, any 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 event in the community at the local faith-based organizations, the churches. They were delighted to have this, and people really paid attention because it was the kids that were making certain statements. Um, you know, it was part of their of their skit that they developed that, you know, based on curriculum that we, we developed at La Maestra and, you know, and delivered by the community in the language that was going to be, you know, received very well. So um, that was fantastic and we hope to be able to um, copy that and use that in, uh, replicate that in with other cultures. We uh, recently had a lot of Burmese settled here in uh, City Heights, uh, where our flagship clinic is located. And the community, um, the Burmese community, think they accept tobacco use for kids as, long, as uh, young as nine years old. And, uh, and drinking also is acceptable. Um, at very young ages, and so the community-based organization, um, which which is the the Burmese or the uh, the Hmong um, population here, they have approached us and said, you know, look, uh, we we definitely want to help La Maestra get the word out on preventative care for so many of these topics. Um, this is what our culture believes these are the problems that, that we're having here within our communities now that uh, these refugees have landed here. Um, and what, what services do you have available that our population will understand and relate to uh, and that are credible? And the other issue, of course, that they mentioned was gambling. That's a huge issue with, uh, with those refugee populations. 
that have recently um, arrived. So what we have begun to do again is look back, explore ways with those cult culturally diverse communities and see what they recommend in terms of, you know, what, what should the message be, how should it be delivered, who should be, de you know, delivering it, um, and, and, and know that the general materials that are available for, you know, the American population is going to be English at a proficiency level that's much higher than a lot of our populations can, um, can read. Uh, so it, it, we really need to get in there and be able to deliver more of these tailored programs, innovative programs with, with each of our populations because that's, that's where it is with us. So we have the Latinos, we have the Burmese, the Somali, the Sudanese, the Chaldeans, the Laotians. I mean, and it just goes on. And each group has their own religious belief about uh, tobacco. Um, is it okay or not? Um, even if it was prohibited back home, now it's like, you know, a lot of the Somali they smoke. Um, and Sudanese and, uh, and you know, the Ethiopians and a lot of the Africans that didn't smoke before now do smoke. So and that goes with drinking as well. So there are really uh, there's a lot of work for community health centers to do around smoking cessation, uh, tobacco prevention that is linked with a lot of other topics that are equally important in time. So I, I think that you know, that would be something that we would recommend because it works for us, you know, taking several topics and then deciding and working and tailoring those to the populations. And again, doing this in concert with partners out there in the community that represent those populations. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Zara, for uh, sharing all this uh, information with us. And uh, our third speaker is Kathleen. Uh, good afternoon, Kathleen. Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Kathleen Malcolm. Thank you for being a part of this webinar. As mentioned before, I've worked for the Family Health Center of Georgia as a health educator. Um, I'm my four point let me get it up. Um hello Kathleen. Sorry. Um at the bottom where you see your PowerPoint logo, you should just be able to click there. There we go. There we go. And just and hit the little icon down in the right hand corner to put it in full screen mode. To the left of uh sixty. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. The service we offer for our smoke cessation program is provided by highly trained staff. One of the first things we do at the health center is working with our patients is to conduct an initial intake assessment. This assessment is used to gather information, utilizing motivational interviewing to assess the health needs of our smoking population within the community. We provide an array of services which include initial visits and assessments by trained medical staff self-help material, individual and group counseling, and these, of course, are confidential. Uh, they're offered one free, quick call, multiple proactive follow-up calls. And, of course, these are offered by trained counseling staff. Slide two. So our clinical practice guidelines consist of all patients are screened for tobacco use 
and they're advised to quit and are offered intervention. There's an intake and assessment form that is usually given to be completed. Action plan, we provide action plans and this plan includes self-management techniques, motivation, support system, and medication. Patients are assessed during their initial visit and are invited to be a part of the program. They are given an initial intake assessment form to be completed. The plan of action is then given. This plan includes self-management goals, and the goal of this program is to get our patients from where they are and decrease the amount of their cigarette intake. Motivation, and this process is used to determine our patients' readiness and how motivated they are to quit smoking. Support system, we encourage our patients to have a good support system. They can invite friends or family members who can motivate them and encourage them to change the way they see themselves and um, their reaction to their smoking or tobacco use. Medication is also provided. Medication can be prescribed for those individuals who a medical provider assesses and it's found that it seems that they are in need or need to be on medication. Slide number three. Within our first session, during our initial session, we go through the treatment and the overview and rational process. We discuss the motivation and uh, we assess their health um, conditions. First, we have to do that assessment to determine uh, what their health condition needs are. We discuss smoking and quitting history, their history, how many times they've made attempts to quit smoking and what they have done in the past. We discuss quitting the met method. Any environmental considerations, we discuss those and see the necessary plan. We talk about self-efficacy and discuss how they can work on improving any such uh, image, self-image. We discuss planning methods. Uh, we do our call summary. We do the initial call. We do follow-up calls, along with calls just to see where they are with their goals. Setting a quick date is very important within the plan. Also addressing these follow-up calls is very important because it helps us to stay with our patients, yeah, and therefore they also see that we are we are actively involved in their uh, in the process of them quitting smoking. Proactive follow-up session. We discuss during our follow-up sessions any quit status where they are within the status where they are. Withdrawal review. We discuss what the plans are how they are, they have withdrawn, what the review is, and also medication. Medications are provided for those that are in need. We also discuss with any challenges and smoking events. What, what are some of the challenges that they are posed with from day to day, on a daily basis, and how they plan to work around these challenges. We discuss their motivation, how motivated they are, what is the determining factor for them to quit, 
and also their support group. Are there friends, are there family, are there anyone that's supporting them? And if not, we encourage, we highly encourage our patients to do have a good support system. They plan for the future, and uh, as far as having a goal, a time, which is a reasonable time frame, to plan when it is that they would like to decrease the amount of cigarette usage or completely quit smoking. We discuss self-image, how they feel about smoking, how they feel about themselves, how they see themselves around others, and um, what it is they would like to see for themselves in the future about smoking and uh, where they would like to be as they see themselves. It is very important as we assess our patients, we look at things such as determining their motivation and uh, within using this assessment form, we're able to work with our community. We look at their electronic medical record and we contact our patients. We follow up, we plan according to the kind of action. And therefore, in gathering this information and using the motivational interviewing, we want to assess the health needs of our smoking population and provide the best services for our population at large. Thank you for having me. Have a good afternoon. Thank you uh, very much, Kathleen, for this uh, excellent presentation. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, all of the uh, our presenters um, for these uh, outstanding presentations. Uh, we are going to start our uh, question and answer session. If you have any question, um, please submit it through the question box or on your control panel or use the hand raise icon and your line will be unmuted. While we wait for the for any questions, uh, we would like to share some resources on smoking cessation to with all of the uh, attendees. And at the same time, we are uh, going to invite them to visit the uh, National Center for Health and Public Housing website, where you can find information, very good information, webinars, monographs, uh, fact sheets, training manuals, newsletters and uh, information about the annual symposium and one-to-one and one-on-one uh, training. You can also join our, our mailing list and you can receive HRSA updates, Medicare updates, funding opportunities, senior programs, resources and services, and uh, information about uh, upcoming webinars. Follow us on Twitter. Um, you can also subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel. And we also would like, uh, would like to invite you to the upcoming symposium. This, one is, uh, this symposium will be held in uh, Alexandria, Virginia from June 10 to 12, 2014. For information about this symposium, you can contact any of the uh, staff members here at uh, North American Management. Um, we have some questions. Uh, the very first question is for Kristen. Um, Kristen, uh, is there any targeted anti-smoking messages or, initi or initiatives just for teens? Yeah, teen tobacco cessation is complicated. The science isn't well developed on that. I know that HHS's website, smokefree.gov, does have a smoke-free teen section, so you should check that out. I'm not sure, to be quite honest, I'm not sure how states 
are handling teen tobacco cessation. I know that some quit lines do allow callers under the age of 18, but it differs among states. And there used to be a national group that had an, a number of resources on to teen tobacco cessation, and um, they no longer receive funding. But what I could do is do a little bit of research, follow up with Rachel, and then uh, perhaps she could send it out to the group. But the overall answer is that we don't really know what works. Okay. Most of the research is focused on adults. Thank you very much, uh, Kristen. Uh, the other question, and I think this one is for you too, uh, are there any resources for uh, training health center staff? Yes. If you look at our tobacco cessation guide, we have a number of resources listed. Um, some universities off the top of my head, University of Massachusetts in New Jersey offers training. The American Lung Association has a freedom from smoking training. The Mayo Clinic offers a tobacco cessation specialist training. And also you may want to contact your state tobacco control program. We identified several states that have initiatives geared towards either public housing or community health centers. So the fact that you are health centers and, and public housing is wonderful. And your, your tobacco control program may be offering trainings for staff and may be able to work with you um, to train your staff. But there are several national organizations that do offer training. And you know some of these will be a couple of hours long. Some of them will be several days and much more intensive. Excellent. Thank you uh, very much. Um, and I think that this question is for you, uh, for the three uh, experts. Um, what has been noted as the most effective cessation medication or strategies according to your experience? Well, this is Kristen, I'll jump in. Um, Chantix has been shown to be quite effective. This does not contain nicotine. It's a prescription pill. There are side effects. Um, you know, I can say that my dad took it and had really bad nightmares and stopped taking it, but it has been shown to be quite effective. And there's more and more research showing that combination therapy is the most effective, specifically the nicotine lo lozenge in combination with the nicotine patch or bupropion, which is a prescription pill. And these combination therapies seem to have a stronger effect on nicotine cravings. This is Zara Marcellian from La Maestra Clinic. Um, we'd like to say that you know, with our populations, <clears throat> what seems to work best is establishing uh, goals with the patients. Um, we have, like, Michelle, you want to explain, like, when, when we do give them the numbers to call, what, they, what usually happens? We have had some patients that when we give them the 1-800 notebooks or any other information regarding quitting, often they come back again and we, uh, we go back again to them and see if they did it. Some patients say they forgot to call that number, that they, they don't have time to call. So we usually, what it goes best for us is setting a goal with them. And every visit they have, we have followed it to see if they are ready to quit or not. Some patients with medications, it's sometimes the insurances that have the, the word to say if they approve it or not. But for us, it's a goal, setting a goal with the patient, it's working better, and it's been helping patients to also quit smoking. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zara and Michelle. Uh, there is another question. Um, I think this is for... Uh, Kathleen and Zara, um, how often do you follow up, uh, for instance, if you have a smoker a patient who declines a cessation services the first time that the, per the person is asked, uh, when is the next time uh, you should inquire? Um, <clears throat> this is Zara and Michelle from La Maestra. Here, I'll let Michelle answer. With the patients, we follow them every visit. 
ever visit the patient that comes in and they don't, they're not ready to quit, we keep asking them if they would like to have, get any help. But it's almost every visit that they come to us that we ask the same question again until the patient is ready to quit. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Uh, Kathleen, uh, do you have? Yes. We also follow up with every visit. Uh, we try to encourage them to um, review and um, reassess them again at that point. But we do follow up with every visit. All right. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, Devon, I don't see any other questions. Do you see any other questions on your end? Um, yes, I did just send the last question to you. Thank you. Um, if you can't see it, I'll be happy to read it. Um, Please, I don't see it. The question is, I want to know if health centers are aware that HUD is actively promoting smoke-free policies and health, and I'm sorry, smoke-free policies in public and assisted housing. Health centers are encouraged to contact local affordable housing providers and offer to provide assistance to residents who want to quit. So it was more of a statement, not really a question. Sorry. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Devin. Let's see if there is anything else. Nope, those are the uh, questions. Well, I want to thank one more time uh, Kristen, Kathleen, Zara, and Michelle for this outstanding presentation. And um, to all of our attendees, please complete the post survey. This helps the National Center for Health and Public Housing to improve our webinars. If you, if you have any training or technical assistance needs, please feel free to contact uh, our talented staff. And once again, thank you very much for attending this webinar, and thank you to our, all of our speakers. Thank you, and have a great afternoon.